The China in Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg. The ACRP promotes balanced, considered reporting on China Africa relations through training programs held throughout the year. More information at africachinareporting.com. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast, a proud member of the Seneca Podcast Network. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by China Global South's managing editor, Kobus van Staden in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. And also, as always, for our Week in Review shows, it's great to have our Francophone editor joining us from the beautiful island of Mauritius. Bonjour, Jeronima. Bonjour, good morning, good afternoon to you all. Yeah, it's great to have you both back. Again, another very lively week in China African news. We're going to cover a lot of ground today. We're going to start in Sudan, where we've been watching all week the events unfold, the tragic events where you just think back to a year ago, and there was promise that Sudan was going to turn the corner, and at least there was the hope that Sudan was going to turn the corner and evolve into a maybe not a democratic government, but at least a stable government. And when you think back over the past 20 years of the difficulties that Sudanese people have been going through, it's just heartbreaking to watch what's happening now. But all for the past uh, all week and maybe even two weeks now, we've been watching the evacuations of foreigners take place. The Chinese were among those, and the Chinese evacuated more than a thousand of their own nationals, and then several hundred Pakistanis as well. We know that the Chinese did this because the Chinese propaganda and state media just went to town. What you're hearing there in the background is the soundtrack, no joke here, is the soundtrack that CGTN used of the Chinese warships that were steaming their way to Sudan, and they made this big deal of their evacuations. Of course, I mean, listen, I don't blame them for doing it, but it's very interesting that you're going to see the tone of not only the music that was in the background, but also some of the comments that were being said. Let me just play some sound for you. This is from uh, a Chinese commander of a PLA warship, Yang Yanhua. He's the commander of Chinese Navy Formation 162. And he was holding a bullhorn. It's very hard to hear what he's saying. So let me just kind of paint this picture for you. He was speaking to hundreds of Chinese nationals who had been evacuated from Khartoum by bus and had arrived at Port Sudan, where they were picked up by these Chinese warships. And with a bullhorn, he said, dear compatriots, no matter where you are, the motherland will always be your strongest backer. Please rest assured we are here everyone will be safe. Okay, so again, it was very faint, but one of the things you heard in the back there was that music kind of creeping in again. And Jiro and Kobus, when, when I was listening to Commander Yang's statements, I was like, wow, I feel like I've heard that somewhere. And it was really on a show that we did back during Chinese New Year, where we featured the trailer of the blockbuster movie Homecoming. And uh, this was the movie that launched last year, did something like $750 million at the box office. It was huge. If you recall from that show, it was set in North Africa, a fictitious North African country, where there was this big evacuation of Chinese nationals from a coup of some kind. And in what you hear from this trailer is this senior Chinese politician saying, our motherland won't give up any compatriot. We will for sure take you all home. And very interesting that Commander Yang used the same language of compatriots and motherland. <laughs> We will for sure take all of you home, he said. There you go, Kobus. Life and art converging here in Sudan over the past six months. Both of you, I'd like to get your takes on both the evacuations, but also a little bit on how 
the media narratives from the Chinese government seem to be echoing some of the, again, these entertainment narratives that we've seen in big blockbuster movies like Homecoming as well as Wolf Warrior 2. Let's get your take, Kobus, on this first. Yeah, as you say, both Homecoming and Wolf Warrior 2 had these very strong messages of this kind of solidarity, solidarity between the state and the citizen. And in that sense... You know, I mean, the the vibe is very specifically Chinese, but this kind of overlap between geopolitics and movies, you know, that obviously also is, you see that a lot in the United States. And that was particularly the hallmark of the Reagan era and later also the Bush era. So that's an interesting. What was also interesting for me is that the way that they leaned into this very, you know, kind of like domestic solidarity kind of narrative obviously is aimed at the Chinese domestic audience. But it was also very interesting to see how that kind of framing completely drowned out the African framing of the situation, which was, will China intervene or will China in some kind of way mediate in Sudan? You know, like I I saw Africans kind of asking that question in relation to the Sudan crisis um, several times. And I think the answer is no, you know, Um, despite the fact that China, you know, had mediated in South Sudan before and also had a peace conference in the Horn of Africa a year ago or so. You know, despite those two kind of, you know, spaces for mediation, I think that this messaging shows that China really isn't interested in mediating at all, you know, in the Sudan situation and is instead really interested in focusing its, you know, the the kind of spectacle of evacuation on a domestic audience. Yeah. What's your take on this? My take is like, as you say, earlier this year when those movies came out, we really spoke about those issues, wondering how China is going to behave in the future. And the message that China was portraying itself as a superpower, being able to protect its citizens overseas in a conflict area. And this is kind of where we see that overlap between geopolitics and the movies and the image that China wants to portray itself. In my coverage of that evacuation story of uh, Chinese from Sudan, I mentioned those two movies. I was like, okay, now China is facing that testing again, you know, the test way is to show how powerful it is to be able to protect its citizen, how much is able to really to deploy itself on the ground to protect and his citizen. But the problem as Kobe said, when he mentioned about the, would China intervene, me personally, I was not really expecting China to intervene in that conflict. And um, we saw how much China kind of pulled away from the Sudan theaters from like few years back already. So seeing China intervening, it was really not really likely to happen. And I, those in Africa were expecting that. I don't know what they were expecting, but seeing China being there was really, really far from what really happened and what would China would do on the ground. So yeah, that was really interesting to see. And let's now see how they're going themselves now to behave on other conflicts, uh, on other area of conflicts in the world. So, yeah. So this is the third major evacuation that the Chinese have done from the Middle East to North Africa. The first one was back in Libya. And that was about 30,000 people. So that was a very sizable evacuation. Then there was Yemen. And then that has been followed by Sudan now. So there is some expertise building up within the Chinese security services. I was surprised that they didn't deploy forces out of the bases in Djibouti to help with the evacuation. Apparently, they brought all of the PLA Navy forces over from China to do that, is my understanding. So I was expecting, again, a little bit more of the use of the Djibouti base because that, in many respects, was the justification for the base all those years ago, was to facilitate evacuations if that need arose, and sure enough, it did in Sudan. In terms of their interest to negotiate this, my guess is that this conflict doesn't lend itself well for mediation at this point. So long as the parties are really just intent at spitting at each other and fighting each other and taking on new weapons, and there's no point in thinking about whether the Chinese are going to step into the middle of this. I think the Chinese would look at a conflict like, or a mediation opportunity like what we saw in Iran and Saudi Arabia, where all of the parties are eager for the Chinese to participate, or in the Arab-Israeli you know, offer where there was a no-lose for them. They offer the mediation, they get turned down, okay, we tried, and then they move on. Same with Russia and Ukraine. This one, I think, is too hot to handle for them at this point. That being said, Kobus, if you recall from back in the early days of the 2010s, Remember, they had Ambassador Zhong Jianhua, who was one of China's most senior ambassadors, who led the South Sudan uh, peace effort for the Chinese. He has long been retired. Their point person on these issues is Xue Bing, who is the special envoy for the Hoyne of Africa. He's a much lower level junior diplomat. His highest rank that he had was ambassador to Papua New Guinea. 
So this is a guy who is, I think, way, way out of his depth in the Horn of Africa by any measure. And so if he's going to be the guy that would lead the mediation effort in Sudan, which one would think because he's the special envoy, then it's not going to happen. I mean, it's really not. I mean, to me, he's this guy's an empty suit. So I don't get the sense that he that China's really stepping up for any kind of mediation efforts. Any final thoughts on Sudan before we move on? You know, I think one of the reasons why China got involved in its, you know, not super successful attempt to mediate in South Sudan years ago was that it was so heavily invested in the South Sudanese and Sudanese oil um, nexus. You know, so South Sudan has a lot of oil fields, but the, the pipelines run through Sudan. So, you know, oil exports from Sudan was this kind of like double deal. Since then, I think the big lesson I think that China took from that is don't be dependent on African oil, you know, and, and so, you know, and subsequently they've, they've diversified all their sources, which means that they don't have any real compelling reason to mediate in, in Sudan, and therefore they don't. I think that's my reading of it. And for me, let's not forget the complexity of the crisis itself. When are we hearing the involvement of different external actors and external countries in the, into the mix? So I think that China won't let itself get dragged into a very complex conflict with different actors and with different interests on the ground. So maybe it's going to wait really for the situation to dial down a bit to really come and try to do something. But even then, I don't really believe that China... And especially Swabing has the depth necessary to handle this kind of situation. And you know, something else occurred to me today as I was thinking about this week that we had the Japanese prime minister and the German chancellor touring Africa this week. And the fact that by this time in the year, when Wang Yi was foreign minister, he had already returned to the continent after his January tour. So Wang Yi generally made at least three trips to Africa every year. Oftentimes, you know, lots of little quick surprise trips. You remember last year he made a quick surprise trip to Ethiopia on his way back from FOCAC or two years ago. Uh, he did a lot of these impromptu trips. It's interesting that we've had a lot of high-level visitors to Africa this year from the U.S., now from the Europeans, the Japanese, uh, quite a few leaders. The Chinese on their high-level visits seem to have dialed them back. And it makes me think that, again, their focus right now is moving away diplomatically from Africa, looking at what's going on in Southeast Asia, the South China Sea, the Middle East, and obviously Russia, Ukraine. And then, of course, a lot of attention from Qing, Qinggang is being focused on the conflict with the United States. So Africa doesn't feel to be as much of a priority diplomatically as it did in the past. Kobus, do you, do you think I'm off base on that? Or am I, you know, what, that, that just, it was a, a thought that came to me today that we haven't really had many high-level Chinese visits this year so far. Wu Peng, the top Chinese diplomat, was there, but he's kind of, you know, that's his job, so we expect him to be there. But other than that, no ministers, no vice presidents. I haven't seen a lot. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, you know, I think China was, was also saving its kind of high-level people for very high-level diplomacy. You know, so, so obviously they had the, the Saudi-Iran, you know, deal, like big stuff with India, like big G20, you know, kind of negotiations and so on, all going on at this time. So I can think that there may well be kind of, you know, this may well be a kind of an off year for African diplomacy, you know, because there's so much else going on. On the other hand, it might also be a situation where the US and Europe is fighting the last war, you know, in the sense that they've, that through, you know, after years of Chinese engagement, Europe and the US has finally woken up to the idea that Africa is important and the Chinese take it seriously. And so now they're kind of rushing to catch up when the Chinese are already moving on to something else. I mean, that's, that's also a possibility we'll have to see. Okay, let's take a look at two other stories that we covered this week that caught my attention, were very interesting, and really speaks to this trend, Cobus, that you and I have been talking about quite a bit in the newsletter that goes out to our subscribers about the growing prominence of what we call subnational actors. So that is, other than the Chinese government in Beijing, provinces, non, you know, st non-state actors, and so forth. And this week, there were two interesting news related to Chinese provinces, first with Hebei and the other one with Hunan. Let's start with Hebei. And uh, that is a province north of Beijing, very, very large northeastern Chinese province. And they started to make an appearance in Africa this week. 
Yeah, Hebei is increasingly interested in, in facilitating agricultural trade, but it also has a bunch of other you know, connections with Africa, including that it's the home of a large Chinese military academy, basically known as basically the West Point of China. And a lot of African military officials have received training there. So obviously over the years, you know, kind of we've focused on this training, and it's interesting that Hebei is now you know, emerging as this kind of diplomatic connection when it's already been doing all of this kind of service provision for African, you know, military training as well. And then there was a big shipment of Kenyan avocados that transited via Hong Kong. 23 tons arrived in Hunan province. And for regular listeners of the show and subscribers to the newsletter, we talk a lot about Hunan. Hunan is emerging as a major agricultural trade hub, a major innovation center for Africa policy. And if you want to see the next generation and the innovations in China's foreign policy in Africa, Changsha and Hunan is the place to go. What was interesting, Kobus, about this story was 23 tons of avocados were snapped up when they landed. I mean, it was just an enormous buy and really good news for Kenyan avocado growers that, number one, these green lanes that the Chinese talked about at FOCAC a couple of years ago are really starting to show dividends. So that means that the agricultural inspection process, the red tape has just been cut down to nothing. And so that really facilitates the importation of fresh fruit like avocados. So that was interesting. Two other interesting points that I wanted to get your take on, and and Joe, I'd like to get your input on this. Number one, 57 Liberian diplomats and Liberian health officials and other government workers went to China for training, and also a delegation of Kenyan military personnel also went to China for training, showing that this training part of their diplomacy is still very, very important. And in a country like Liberia, where the size of the government is one of the smallest in Africa in terms of the overall population, 57 people may not seem like a lot numerically, but in terms of the overall government, it is quite a large delegation going to China. So, Giro, we're really seeing the influence of Chinese training programs really, really high, even though we've talked about how other aspects of the China-Africa relationship may have been diminished. Yes, that training part remained a very essential component of Chinese influence in Africa, where they really try hard to keep contact with the high-profile, high officials in Africa. It's funny that you mentioned Liberia and Kenya. Two interesting facts is, for instance, Liberia, when I think about the last Afrobarometer report, like Liberia is the country where China, in terms of influence, is less, it has a much less positive influence than the U.S. The U.S. is much more appreciated in Liberia than China, but you see China still trying to Again, more ground in Liberia officials training and and really trying to catch up with the uh, Lib- Liberian elites. And the same thing also with Kenya. And that's a story that I've read yesterday when we saw how the Confucius Institute is training Kenyan official into Chinese language in the Kenyan army. So that training component is really very important part of Chinese influence in Africa. And I think they're going to keep on doing that and they're going to try because Let's face it, in terms of soft power and human-to-human connection, they are not as much as strong as the former colonial power, the U.S., France, Belgium, and England. But they have to catch up on those areas where they now have to gain more ground over the years. Kobus, it's been two years since Lina Ben Abdallah, our friend who is now a full tenured professor at Wake Forest Universities. Congratulations, Lina. That is a huge accomplishment. Mazel tov to her. Uh, She posted that on Twitter today, so I thought that was nice to see. But she wrote a whole book on this about these knowledge networks that go between the Chinese and Africans. And you can see how important her work two years later remains in terms of these training programs. Yes. You know, now that China is, is emerging out of its COVID era, you know, it looks like the training is coming back with it, you know, that they're, they're reawakening it. Because, of course, it is a relatively low cost way of building, you know, high high quality influence in Africa. So, you know, so so, so one can see why they resurrected it. Just quickly, also in relation to the, the role of sub-national actors in trade, it's interesting that beyond the provinces, we're also now seeing cities starting to emerge. So today we covered in the newsletter a small note 
notice that the the Chinese city of Dalian has signed an MOU with a fruit growers association in Chile. And Dalian is going to be functioning basically as part of a logistics corridor that's going to be funneling Chilean fruit and fresh produce, not only into northeast China, but also from there on transshipment wise to Japan and South Korea. So it's very interesting to see, you know, both provinces and cities kind of taking on this trade role. So just as we've said for many, many years, you can't talk about Africa as a country and you can't flatten the continent because of the diversity within Africa. The same is true in China as well. And too often people are talking about China as this singular entity. And and that's just a big mistake as we're hearing about Dalian, Hunan, Hebei, Changsha. We talked about Chongqing, the big industrial city in the southwest. Shanghai is a big player. Guangdong for a long time, that big province in the south. And so in, in many respects, again, the complexity of the Chinese actors makes it very interesting as where we are today. And it's one of the new dynamics in the China-Africa relationship where the central government is starting to kind of pull back in many respects and giving the provinces and these subnational actors more room to move. Okay, gentlemen, we're going to have some fun now. We're going to transition to the fun part of the show. The first part was all about news and then what's going on. Now we're going to kind of step back And there were a couple of events this week, and actually, I don't even know if it happened this week, but they went viral this week, so we're going to cover it this week. And Kenyan President William Ruto, he's a fascinating guy, and from time to time, he just speaks truth, and it's incredible to see how he doesn't seem to care. And when you see a politician kind of take a shot of truth serum, and whether they're in Africa or anywhere else, it is really a sight to behold. So... President Ruto was at an event organized by Mo Ibrahim. Mo Ibrahim, if you're not familiar with him, he's one of Africa's wealthiest philanthropists. He really speaks about governance, and he is one of the heavy hitters in the philanthropy space in Africa. He's got a lot of awards and things like that, and he speaks to power. So he was on stage with William Ruto, and William Ruto just spoke truth, and we're going to talk about it. So let's listen to a couple of these sound bites. First, I'm going to talk about how he mentioned this fact, and a lot of people on Twitter and WhatsApp and these groups that we're in really resonate with this idea that the conferences, the Africa Plus One conferences that Japan, Russia, China, and others have, he finds demeaning. Let's take a listen. We have also decided that it will not going to be business as usual. We have these meetings, Africa... Uh, U.S. meeting, Africa-Europe, Africa-Turkey, Africa-India. Uh, now we are waiting for, there is another one, Africa-Russia. And Africa-Japan. And Africa-Japan. We have made the decision that it is not intelligent for 54 of us to go and uh, sit before one gentleman from another place. And I mean, and, and sometimes we are, we are mistreated. Uh, yeah. You know, we are loaded into buses like school kids, you know, and, and it's, not, it's not right. First of all, Giraud, let's do a little bit of fact checking on the president there. Number one, the school bus reference that he mentioned that loaded into buses uh, was not at any of these summits that he talked about. That was at the Queen's funeral. And what a lot of people online did not want to mention was the fact that while Africans were indeed put into buses, so was every other head of state that attended that funeral except the U.S. president. So that is a kind of an important point to note. Did you also find it interesting that neither Mo Ibrahim or President Ruto put China in their list of countries where they have the Africa One summits and they are objecting to. I don't know. I just that was odd to me that China was conveniently left out of that list. You know, Giro, I know you were you were on Twitter fighting the war on this one this week. So give us your take on the buses and what uh, Ruto said. So my take on the buses, as I said on Twitter, as I will be exchanging with our friend Lina Ben Abdallah, I was saying, first of all, it was during the funeral of the Queen Elizabeth in England. And second of all, Africa were not the only ones in the buses. We're almost 
everybody. Emmanuel Macron with his wife was on the buses. Jay Bolsonaro was on the buses. The Japanese delegation was on the buses. Everyone was on the buses except for Joe Biden. So for me, using that analogy was like kind of like a bit of populistic, you know, trying to portray themselves that, you know, we want more dignity, which is really important to say. And I really mean that. But they have really to be, you know, not playing on the emotional parts of the narrative and the, the, the how things are portrayed, but to be more, more, much more like, you know, factual on what happened so for that I, I do believe that yeah he tried to do something on that to really gain some point not mentioning china i don't think they wanted to mention china but i think they had china in the background because let's face it in the last what 10 10 15 years china has been the only one being more consistent in terms of africa plus one summit and the last one who kind of made a change was france Afrique. france Afrique was also one of more consistent but with macron macron had a different approach to the france Afrique to the displeasing of many African leaders, but that was uh, Macron's style. But the one who was more consistent was China, Africa. So maybe they didn't want to frustrate China by mentioning China, but they're just like, we don't want to do that anymore. But my question was like, when he's saying like that, did he really inform the other, other, the, the other head of state, Chinese? Do the Chinese know now that the next forecast won't be China plus 54? It's going to be China one plus, I don't know. Well, no, no. I'm glad you raised that question because shortly after he had a solution. So this is what President Ruto proposes instead of 54 heads of state going to sit in front of Xi Jinping or Joe Biden. This is what he proposes instead. The decision that we have made as AU is that going forward, if there is going to be a discussion between Africa and any other country, we are going to be represented by the chair the outgoing chair, the income, the bureau. Let us. Let Chairs us the commission and, and the chair and and uh, and and the chair of the RECs, and we have five RECs. Uh-huh. That should be sufficient. Okay. For I mean, a meeting of uh, maybe six, seven, maybe six, seven. Yeah. That should be able to represent Africa, and that is the position I am taking as the president of Kenya. For any other meeting that we are going to have with all these uh, requests that we have a meeting between Africa and one other country. We respect the sovereignty of others. I think no. to ask for, to be, for a reciprocation is not to ask for too much. No. And for us to agree that let us have this kind of uh, setup. The only, um, uh, because I had a conversation with President Kagame and he, he actually led that particular position. I have had a conversation with Prime Minister Abiy. He believes very strongly that that should be the position Mm. of of our continent. Because, as you have said, if we we don't respect ourselves, nobody is going to respect us. And and we should be able to take that kind of decision. And part of that uh, respecting ourselves is when we say African problems, African solutions, we, we must be serious about the solutions. It cannot be rhetoric. It cannot be talk. Now, Kobus, this is a complete piece of BS, okay? I mean, this is a ridiculous proposal because you know what he said? He said, I talked to the prime minister of Ethiopia and Rwanda, and I'm sure he probably agrees with what the, you know, the president of Nigeria said. The African lions are going to eat first. Of course, the big states are going to say we agree with this. I bet you he didn't talk to the president of Botswana. I bet you he didn't talk to the president of Mali or the smaller countries, because at the end of the day, you put the big powers in front. We have no confidence whatsoever that Nigeria or Kenya or Ethiopia or any of the big powers will act on behalf and make concessions, real economic concessions and political concessions on behalf of their smaller neighbors. South Africa, the same. Yeah, definitely. But I think already in this kind of framing, you're already skipping a few steps ahead. So I wrote a, like some, I did research for Sire on, on kind of Africa plus one summary a few years ago. And at that stage already, like that's at least five years ago, like there was, there were a free, many, many people complaining about this very same thing and suggesting that the AU should be standing in for Africa. And you know who shot that down? All of the African countries. Like, none of the African countries trusted each other enough to be able to have this kind of representative kind of, you know, arrangement that he is now, you know, suggesting. It's not only even that it's strong countries versus weak countries, which it is, but it's also that the strong countries themselves don't trust each other enough to be able to have them play that role. So I am willing to bet money 
Like, I will be buying drinks for the two of you. You know, if this goes ahead, which I don't think it will, but if it goes ahead, I am willing to bet beers for the two of you that it will get scuppered by some complaint about like how Nigeria is undermining blah, 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 blah. This sounds great, but it's going to 100% fall on because of infighting between African countries, not only between strong and weak ones, but between strong ones themselves. And when he said that, Giraud, I thought of you, that he said he spoke with President Kagame. And I wonder how many people in the DRC are going to think to themselves, well, you know what? If President Kagame likes this idea, <laughs> F it. We're not on board. Right? Exactly. Multiply that dynamic across the continent and you have the reason why it won't happen. So this is not a realistic option. I mean, this is a ridiculous... But again, I started this whole conversation saying, well, he was speaking truth to power. Well, this is great. Instead, what he seems to be doing is speaking in really broad populist terms that do exceedingly well in TikTok reels and TikTok shorts and social media where everybody goes, yeah, stick it to the man. Yeah, but the reality is like, we, we do know that that's going to happen. We do know that you tell us, Congolese, that, you know, the next China-Africa summit, Kagame will be representing the Great Lake or the East African region. Who's going to allow that to happen? Say, we're never going to do that. Say, if Rwanda is going to be there, DS is, DRC wants to be there as well. So the reality is, structurally speaking, the AU doesn't carry the interest of all African countries. And the African countries that don't really trust the AU of the AU Bureau or even administration to be able to convey the message. I think you already said that before. This proposition is going to create uh, losers and winners in Africa. And most of the winners are going like to be small countries with small economies. The big winners are going to be countries like South Africa, Nigeria, Egypt, Kenya, of course. Those countries are able to have a one-to-one -one with China, other powerful countries. They are small countries who for those Africa Plus One summits are the opportunities to have like a sidebar one-to-one -one meeting for five, seven minutes to pitch an idea. When they don't have that, it's really going to be complicated. You, won't, you cannot believe that Benin is going to trust, I don't know, Nigeria to talk about Benin issue when it's going to meet with China or when they're going to have the summit. No. So at the end, a lot of populistic ideas, but not really ideas that really matches the reality of African politics and the relationship between African countries. And I do believe that that's not going to work. And I think you would face a lot of opposition from African countries like Benin, for example, uh, particularly with FOCAC and the Chinese in particular, because one of the dynamics of what FOCAC is. So yes, you have the big forum where President Xi or ministers and they all kind of get together and there's a big photo app. What you don't see as much is outside, and this happened in Dakar, they set up a tent and Wang Yi, who was then foreign minister, parked himself there. And what was fascinating was country after country, almost like Shark Tank, lined up and they got, you know, five minutes in front of Wang Yi and a whole bunch of senior ministers to pitch the fact that they want a road or they want a network or they want they have these infrastructure projects. These are countries that don't ordinarily get that kind of face time with someone like Wang Yi. I think they would resist mightily the idea of them being shut out and relegating all of the negotiations to the Nigerians, the Ethiopians, and the Kenyans and South Africans. And this was really important because I remember when we were talking about this during FOCAC and the Sierra Leoneans presented a big highway project. And, and, they, and, they, and you saw there was on Twitter, they had their whole, you know, their pictures, their models, the whole thing. It really did remind me like Shark Tank. And the idea that that gets taken away... I don't think it's going to go down well. Now, interesting, Jeho, that you point out the fact that the AU itself is weak. And what's funny is that after all of this rhetoric that William Ruto said about why the AU needs to take the lead, why a small group of countries needs to take lead, he kind of ended some of his comments with kind of saying the AU is messed up. We have the wrong architecture in the management of the Africa Union. Yes, yeah. I'm glad you said that. Yeah. Okay, not me. Yeah. Musa Faki, who is the chair of our Africa Union Commission, can do very little because we have retained all the powers as heads of state. Right. And yet, you cannot run one country and run the continent of Africa. Right? We seriously need an interrogation of the management of the Africa Union. Today, we cannot even support Somalia, we are, the, we are waiting for EU 
to give us $85 million. $85 million. You know, we, we cannot fund it as AU. It is stupid. I mean, it, my brother. It is my, madness. My, so, yeah. so the are operation, you telling me 54 countries, 60 years after independence, they cannot manage 85 million to sort out Somalia, which has no government? So there you go, Kobus. That's your point. I mean, the presidents have retained the power. They've basically made the AU impotent or effectively completely without power. And then at the idea that the AU is going to represent the incontinent negotiating with China, it, again, it's just it's perplexing a little bit. What's your take on it? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think he's right. You know, the AU is weak, but the AU is weak because it's being kept weak by the heads of state, as he as he pointed out. You know, so, yeah, I mean, I find it a little bit disingenuous for an African kind of head of state to be suddenly very surprised at this state of events, you know. But, you know, one also has to, has to point out that one of the reasons why, you know, first Japan and then China decided to go with this 54 plus 1 model is to avoid the optics of picking and choosing between African countries, you know, between having a tier 1 and a tier 2 of African countries. And one sees that very same criticism. Oh, they're picking and choosing, they're dividing and ruling. When anyone else tries to do a smaller selection. You know, some of the meetings between U.S. presidents and African leaders came in for that exact criticism because they didn't do a full-on, you know, 54 plus one summit. So there's no winning here. Giraud, do you think that they've canceled the plans for the next FOCAC? <laughs> I don't believe they canceled the plans. I don't the think so either. I don't think so either. That's why I'm asking. Did he inform Xi Jinping already that, you know, the next no. FOCAC is going to be just you plus few countries only? you head of states i don't know <laughs> this is called politics this is called politics but it was it was a refreshing discussion to have and i love the candor that he used and that was really great but it's kind of dangerous what he said because if the next focac doesn't happen the way he portrayed it to be the way it's, his credibility doesn't stand that much anymore it's like it's not really for him to make that kind of statement i hope he had in advance told the Chinese or the other countries that, you know, we're going to do that from now on. Otherwise, it's going to be really complicated. It played well on social media, though. It played well on social media. Okay, let's close out our discussion today in the United States. And I just want to kind of pull back the curtain a little bit on the U.S. political process and a part of the process that many people may not understand. By the way, there's a new show on Netflix starring Carrie Russell as an American diplomat. And she is tapped by the president to be the next ambassador to London. And it's very funny because anybody who knows American politics knows that you don't get called into the Oval Office and told you're going to be our next ambassador to country X. And then the next day, they're put onto a, a private jet, no less, which most American diplomats don't fly private jets, as far as I understand, and then head off to your new job. What really happens is you go through this painful almost like a proctology exam of a Senate confirmation process. And what's happened in Washington is that these Senate confirmation processes have just been pulled into the nightmare politics of the United States today between red and blue and MAGA conservatives and Democrats, and it's just awful. But a drama has been playing out over the, the nominee to be the U.S. ambassador to the African Union. And it's very interesting because China is now serving as a kind of filter across almost anything to do in Washington today, especially when it comes to Africa. So I want to tell you about Ambassador Stephanie Sullivan. So she's the nominee to be the envoy to the African Union, as I mentioned. Previously, she was stationed in Ghana. And last year, when Sullivan was the ambassador to Ghana, she gave an interview to City TV, which is one of the major broadcasters, where she talked about her background when she first joined the Foreign Service and the fact that she had a tough time passing the foreign service exam. And she, in fact, she said in the interview that she failed it twice. Now, at the time, she said she was working in a remote part of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and she came to Kinshasa to take the exam. So let's pick up the interview from there. The first year I took the exam, it was, you know, pencil and paper. I came in from my village 
uh, to the Capitol, and I was on village time, and you know, I'm I couldn't even get through the English grammar <laughs> section, which was my forte, because I was on village time, and I hadn't gotten through about two thirds of the questions, wow. and they said, "Okay, time's up," and so I didn't pass that year, and then um, I took it. How did you feel? Um, well, I felt really strange when I couldn't even complete the part that was easy. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I thought, well, you know, I'm not unemployed, I'm doing my thing, so let me try again next year. So there's a little bit of that little engine that could. Exactly. I think I can, I think I can. <laughs> um, but it wasn't like, oh my gosh, I have to do this or my life will be over. It was like, all right, let me try again. So the next year I tried again and I also didn't pass. Um, and then the following year I, I, I did pass. So that's kind of a charming story, you know, telling a little bit of the backstory that not everybody is passing this very difficult exam the first time. Uh, it didn't really make much news, but then last week it surfaced on Capitol Hill and uh, Senator J.D. Vance from Ohio, who is a MAGA Republican backed by the venture capitalist Peter Thiel. And this was the guy, by the way, who wrote the the really fascinating book, Hillbilly Elegy. So if you've been following that book and he was a sane guy back then, and now he's kind of on the more crazy tuned side of American politics. Well, guess what? His staff picked up on that interview and, uh, and put a nice little China spin onto it. This is an ambassador, Ambassador Sullivan, who went to uh, Ghana and said on local television that she was proud of the fact that she had failed her foreign service exam twice. Uh, it's hard to imagine a Chinese... Uh, leader going to a country where they were trying to develop diplomatic relationships and bragging about failing any type of foreign service exam. And I don't know where this idea that we should celebrate failing the for foreign service exam amongst our diplomatic corps comes from, uh, but it doesn't make us look good and it doesn't help Ambassador Sullivan in her duties. Oh, I mean, that, I mean, again, the that everything gets tinged with China now in Washington. So imagine, and, and he's, by the way, he's not wrong that anybody would, you know, a you can never imagine a Chinese ambassador saying, guess what, guys, I failed the exam twice before I made it here. Inconceivable. In fact, nobody would do it. Some people might say, though, that one of the best qualities of the Americans is the fact that we do have people who can talk more openly about these things. Not everybody is an Autobot perfect test taker, I don't know. I found what Ambassador Sullivan did quite charming and quite relatable. And I thought it was kind of silly that J.D. Vance brought that up. What was your take on it? She was saying something more complicated than I think he was hearing, right? Kind of because, because she was saying, like, I'm not obsessed with this kind of book learning because I was on the ground in rural Africa doing good and providing aid, you know, kind of like before I even thought of, you know, kind of going for this high profile position, you know? So, so she's, she's, making a, she's making a point of, of kind of real, real experience versus book learning, you know, which he is then <laughs> flying over at for five million feet, you know? So so, yeah, it's, it's, it's all very disingenuous, I think. So for me, it was like just funny the way they tried to put the China spin into it. I was like, it doesn't make sense. It's right to complain about whatever reason uh, she, she did that or it's not, it doesn't portray well about the U.S. diplomacy, whatever. I really don't care that much. But does it really, did it really need into, to bring China into the mix as if, Everything needs to be because of China. If China doesn't do that, we don't do it. If China does it, we have to do it better. Or I mean, it just become a bit of kind of ridiculous in a certain way that to try to, you know, to sh if he doesn't want to see her appointed, good for him. But don't use the China card as like, you know, China doesn't do it. Yes, we, we don't have to do it. So, yeah, it's just like doesn't make sense that much. So Senator Vance's main objection against Ambassador Sullivan's nomination isn't that she took a few times to pass the Foreign Service exam, as outraged as he sounded on, on that previous clip. But it's got more to do with her support of LGBTQI plus issues during her time as ambassador to Ghana, when back in 2021, she raised a pride flag over the embassy. And that did not sit well with J.D. Vance, nor with a lot of conservative Republicans. Vance seems to think she is going to promote diversity and inclusion issues in her new role at the African Union, 
which he objects to and once again frames the issue in the context of China. We have built a foreign policy of hectoring and moralizing and lecturing countries that don't want anything to do with it. The Chinese have a foreign policy of building roads and bridges and feeding poor people. And I think that we should pursue a foreign policy, a diplomacy of respect and a foreign policy that is not rooted in moralizing. It's rooted in the national interest of this country. Because Ambassador Sullivan is at the lead of moralizing instead of pursuing America's national interest, I object. So that clip, Cobus, went viral on right-wing media in the United States and right-wing Twitter. And what's interesting is that at first I was like, okay, that's interesting. You and I have been talking a lot about the fact that the United States moralizes quite a bit on democracy issues and things like human rights and things like that. He was talking only in the context of LGBTQI plus issues and specifically trans issues. So that's the moralization he's talking about. He's not talking about the traditional issues on democracy and human rights and rule of law and things like that. So here we have, again, the Chinese serving as the benchmark. The Chinese, they don't talk about this kind of stuff. So therefore, we shouldn't talk about this kind of stuff. Kobus, let's get your take. Yeah, it was very funny for me. He could, like J.D. Vance could be working for the Chinese foreign ministry. I mean, he was he was hitting every talking point that, that he sounded like Mao Ning. So, you know, so, so that's funny. <laughs> I'm sure he would take uh, great offense at that comparison. Well, you know, kind of like I have to say, like, I take great offense at the at, at the way that particularly trans issues are being weaponized in US and UK politics at the moment. The way that this extremely small, extremely vulnerable little population who's really only trying to survive is now being turned into this political football by very, very powerful forces, I think is deeply immoral. And, you know, particularly in the context of recent very disturbing anti-LGBT legislation coming in Uganda, where we know that U.S. right-wing Christian groups were directly involved in pushing for and advocating for some of the worst legislation on these issues in the world. Now, you know, this is absolutely a horror show of a set of laws that literally target people simply for identifying, you know, kind of uh, as, as LGBT. So, you know, kind of that is a major human rights abuse. It's a major human rights abuse in Africa and it's a major human rights abuse in the US. And the way that kind of that, for example, healthcare is being targeted in a way to essentially eradicate a small, vulnerable population is textbook human rights abuse. So, you know what? Don't talk to me about this nonsense. You know, kind of like, this is beyond the pale. And for him to then kind of, to, to you know, kind of to then paint it as some kind of like horse race issue with China is despicable, I think. So there's going to be real consequences for these laws, Cobus, as you pointed out, far beyond the LGBTQ community, all the way to the general population. The United States has already said that it is going to suspend its PEPFAR funding. I think it's up to $2 billion a year in Uganda. And that is going to withhold supplies of antiretrovirals for you know thousands of people who have HIV. So this is a really serious issue. I think that a lot of African governments are going to run up against how serious the Americans are on some of these issues. And it's not just rhetoric, but there, there's going to be a financial cost to this and a health cost to this. So we're going to see this this question, Giro, play out in terms of values. And again, they're going to, China is being sucked into the middle of this. China doesn't do this. But the United States do have a set of values in their foreign policy. And this level of tolerance for LGBT issues is one of them. Remember, Two years ago, the United States pulled its ambassador out of Zambia, if I recall. He was asked to leave, but he stood up for LGBT issues, and that was the reason why he was asked to leave. So this is potentially a major flashpoint between a number of African countries. But interesting how, again, in Vance's comments, China played a role. I do believe that the issue is going to be really a very devising point between the U.S. and African countries. And uh, unfortunately, as I was saying earlier, China get caught in the mix. And I'm going to China. I'm going to add Russia into the, in, into the debate as well. And I do believe that playing that card is going to be very, very difficult for the U.S. to move forward with this diplomacy in Africa because so far... African country, the large majority, they are really standing against that policy. So I really don't see how it's going to play out in the future. If they they cut PEPFAR from Uganda, um, uh, they're going to do that all over in Africa and different issues we don't know yet. So the question is how realistic they're going to be and how 
they're going to promote their foreign policy on the ground, knowing that it's really not welcomed by African countries. Well, let's keep an eye on Stephanie Sullivan's confirmation in the Senate. Again, China has played a very important role in that confirmation, so it'll be very interesting to keep an eye on. So lots happening this week. Again, we want to invite all of you, if you're interested in these topics, this is what we talk about each and every day in our newsletter and on our website. And by the way, we're developing some very cool new products to help students and researchers and analysts in their understanding of China-Africa issues and China Global South issues more broadly. So if you'd like to join the conversation that Giro, Gobus, and myself and the rest of the CGSP team are having every day, go to chinaglobalsouth.com slash subscribe. Uh, you can try it out free for a month. And if you don't like it, you can cancel any time, but hopefully you'll join us and support the independent journalism that these great guys are doing and our whole team is doing. Jero Kobus, thank you so much for your insights. Very quickly before we go, Jero, tell everybody where they can find the great work that you're doing. They can find us on www.projectafrikshin.com or on Twitter, Afrikshin. Afrikshin, Afrik with a K in one world, Afrikshin. And if you want to sign up for Giraud's free newsletter, it comes out twice a week on Tuesdays and Fridays. You can do so over on his website. The links are in the show notes. Just go to the top of the webpage and you can put your email address in there and it'll be there. So for Kobus, Giraud and me here in Ho Chi Minh City, thank you so much for joining us. We'll be back again next week with another edition of the China in Africa podcast. Thanks so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Tag us on Twitter at China GS Project and visit us at ChinaGlobalSouth.com. If you speak French, check out our full coverage at projetafriquechine.com and Afrikchine on Twitter. That's Afrique with a K. And you'll also find links to our sites and social media channels in Arabic. <laughs>